Hi, folks. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Adam Thorburn, and I am delighted to be hosting today's event to mark the publication of Playing Poker with Tennessee Williams, the new poetry collection by Kevin Pilkington. So um, I think all of you are on mute, but uh, please, uh, for respect for Kevin and for the rest of the audience, please make sure that you are on mute for the, for the course of the reading. Um, the agenda for today's event, Kevin has agreed to start by reading selected poems from his new collection. Then we'll open things up for everyone to ask questions uh, to Kevin about his poetry and his life as a writer. Kevin and I promise to wrap everything up with a hard stop at five o'clock. So while I urge all of you to visit Kevin's website, which I am dropping into the chat right now. Here we go. There we go. Uh, uh, you can read his detailed biography and to see a full list of his publications, but I just wanted to give all of you a brief overview of Kevin's professional career. This is Kevin's 10th published collection of poetry. His poems have been anthologized widely and published in countless journals and magazines. He's the winner of numerous awards and prizes for his writing. He is also a novelist. His novel, Summer Shares, is published by Arch Books. He is on the faculty, the writing faculty of Sarah Lawrence College. And Kevin is also a much sought after public speaker and educator. He's taught classes, conducted workshops, and given poetry readings all over the United States and across the globe. Um, before I pass this over to Kevin, I just, I, I wanted to share with all of you an insight that I had after reading Playing Poker with Tennessee Williams. I, I, I came to this, uh, this realization or um, to be more accurate, it reconfirmed something to me about my belief on poets and their craft. Um, there are many professions or artistic disciplines in which the specialists or the experts in those fields peak early in their lives. They reach the zenith of their talents and their abilities when they're young. Athletes, ballet dancers, and opera singers, just to name a few. The opposite seems to be true, however, for many poets who, as they mature, their work gets richer and more complex. As they age, their technical artistry becomes more refined, their use of language subtler, their sensitivities are heightened and sharpened. This all could not be more true of Kevin Pilkington. The narrative voice that Kevin has been honing and polishing over the years in his poems has entered into its prime. Playing poker with Tennessee Williams is a vibrant example of the poet's craft entering into its golden age. In my opinion, Kevin is more extravagantly and vividly himself in these new poems than he has ever been before. It really is my privilege and my honor to present to all of you, my friend, Kevin Pilkington. Kevin, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Adam. Um, that was really a gracious uh, introduction and I appreciated every word. Um, and I wanna thank you all for coming to help me celebrate the uh, launch of my new collection. So um, as uh, Adam said, I'm gonna read some poems from the collection. And then after that, hopefully you'll have some uh, questions that, I, that I, hopefully I can answer uh, or some thoughts and comments on, on, on the work or poetry in general. So um, I'm gonna start with the uh, very first poem in the, uh, in the collection. Um, I, I, I'm fortunate that uh, my poetry is basically landscape poetry. Landscape sort of ignites my poems. Um, and uh, you know, some Irish poets call it uh, uh, place wisdom. And so you, you learn from your surroundings and you can play off and you connect with it, it's sort of metaphysical in a sense. Um, and since I live in New York, I'm very fortunate since the landscape is, uh, is all around me, all kinds of strange uh, scenes and, uh, and goings on. And um, I literally looked out uh, the window of my bedroom and I saw this couple out uh, on the sidewalk on, on a bench 
And this is where this particular poem comes from. And it's called Pomegranate. A woman walks by the bench I'm sitting on with a dog that looks part lab, part Buick. Stops and asks if I would like to dance. I smile, tell her of course I do. We decide on a waltz that she begins to hum. We spin and sway across the street in between parked cars and I can tell she realizes she chose a man who understands the rhythm of sand, the boundaries of thought. We glide and Fred and Ginger might come to mind or a breeze filled with the scent of flowers of your choice. Coffee stops flowing as a waitress stares out the window of a diner while I lead my partner back across the street. When we come to the end of our dance, we compliment each other. And to repay the favor, I tell her, be careful, since the world comes to an end just three blocks to the east of where we stand. Then I remind her, as long as there's a 59 Cadillac parked somewhere in a backyard between here and Boise, she will dance again. As she leaves content with her dog, its tail wagging like gossip, I am convinced now more than ever that I once held hundreds of roses in my hands the first time I cut open a pomegranate. Um, this, this, this next poem um, I added at the very end before I sent the, the collection off to the publisher. And, um, you know, as, as you know, uh, you know, we're all going through a very difficult year. And I guess it was during the first three years here in Manhattan. I, I think I think we lost close to thirty thousand uh, people in New York City uh, as 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 of now. Uh, but in the very beginning, the very first three months, it was it was just horrifying, you know. And um, this poem sort of comes out of that anxiety, and that fear, that frustration, and anger. Um, uh, the title is uh, not asking for much. I want it growing like a wolf as it runs towards me before it lunges. Godzilla stomping each footfall an earthquake as it moves up First Avenue. A spaceship shaped like a large plate in the middle of a dinner table with enough food in it to feed a family of five. Spinning a strange sound before it lands in Central Park. I need noise that will give me enough time to run and get away. Instead, this virus is the invisible man, Claude Rains, walking silently. I have no idea when it attacks. There's no special ray gun or sword that lights up when lifted in both hands. Instead, the weapon isn't designed by Spielberg. It turns out to be a bar of soap. That's right, the bar of soap that rests in a dish near my toothbrush. It can't kill the virus except for the germs growing in it. We all have to stay at least six feet away from strangers to help stop the spread. I like to stay as far away from them as my ex-wife, but not as far as my last girlfriend. A hot spot used to mean a trendy restaurant downtown where I could never, ever get a table. Now, the entire city is a hot spot, where there are no empty beds in any hospital that is filled with the sick and dying. New York, this has got to stop. I want you back the way you were. I want subways to rattle and shake the fear out of me. Trains to leave Grand Central and come back the exact same way. Empty streets crowded again with people whose faces are countries I have never been to and all laughing and talking, blending together, sounding like the globe. It's not asking much. I don't wanna wear a mask anymore as if I'm riding with the James gang on our way to rob a Chase bank. I want to be able to sneeze and not be afraid I killed anyone. At least I still believe in the leaves on the trees outside my apartment building. They will soon look like they were dipped in cream for two weeks before blowing away and are the first sign of spring every year. Come on, New York, I am not asking for much. I would give anything, really just about anything, if I could simply walk up to you and shake your hand. When I, when I wrote it, I didn't realize vaccines were coming. So that there's hope. Um, we live in the we live in the uh, in the '90s on the east side of Manhattan, and there are a lot of churches that surround us. 
uh, different denominations. I understand God's in each and every one of them. Uh, but this particular church uh, is a Catholic church. And, um, and it's called Black Coffee and Sermons. The doors to St. John's Church are locked every night at 7 p.m. with a chain drooping like a loose belt across its doors. Even with Jesus shut in for the night, a few miracles can take place outside. Nothing too big. The Jets have a two-game winning streak. A woman with curves like a Coke bottle may have smiled at you and not the guy walking nearby. And every bus you are late for awaits and refuses to leave without you. The big miracles kick in when the doors open in the morning. Inside, it's a lot more showbiz these days. Candles line up along the walls like the Rockettes in flickering gold costumes. Sermons every Sunday or Seinfeld episodes or repeats with the jokes you have heard over and over, but still make you laugh. St. Michael the Archangel with his long hair and sword is now a superhero with a two-picture movie deal in his pocket. And the voice of God sounds more and more like Gregory Peck every visit. Stop in during the week when there is no one there except saints and angels waiting. You can pray for that three-day work week so you can use the leftover 48 hours to feed your dog. It may even help you understand why, you, why your smartphone is just average and the next siren passing you here will never be the guy from Butte, Montana who claims he's your brother, even though you have to admit he has your nose. Don't forget to give thanks for the woman who loves you and hasn't yet realized her mistake. Every film with De Niro in it, mashed potatoes, Chet Baker's version of Look for the Silver Lining, Keith Richards' guitar lead in Sympathy for the Devil. Never stay too long, though. Time for these statues is a cup of black coffee with the refills, they will, and they will go on talking and talking the way only marble can, since they want you to forget you were alone, lost, and on your knees. Uh, I read uh, not too long ago that T.S. Eliot said that um, if you get stuck, those of you who, who write and you just don't know what to write about, dip into your childhood. You can always find a lot to write about there. So I dipped into mine and, uh, and this is based on, on, on a childhood experience. It's called At the Other End of the Hall. I learned a lot about hunger early on. It was the way cancer ate, always starving, feeding on my grandmother in the bedroom down the hall from mine. It was the last month and the only time she lived with us. I was eight. Whenever she moaned and groaned out loud, it, I knew it was feeding, gnawing on everything it could get its tumors on until the night I heard nothing. So I walked down the hallway that stretched like taffy and slowly opened the door. The bed she was in looked like a big ship. Her arms were thin white bones lying across her chest, a pirate flag resting against the pillow. And she was staring the way a novel does that no one will ever open, no one will ever read again. Uh, my, my, uh, my dad was born in uh, Kilnadema, Galway, Ireland. And uh, which, so there was a lot of talk about Ireland growing up. And I can remember being in um, first or second grade and, and, and the nun said, does anybody know where the Holy Land is? And I raised my hand, I said, yeah, Dublin. And uh, so obviously I was wrong. But my dad always used to say that the reason God created booze is so the I Irish were gonna take over the world. And um, I think this poem sort of supports his saying. It's called the photo of my grandfather smoking a cigar. And I actually found this photo in, in the closet right across the way from here. Um, so I had a grandfather who never vi visited us much. My dad didn't want him to. I came across this old photo of him in a box after cleaning out my closet. He's sitting in our backyard, a cigar in his mouth so he didn't have to talk to us. It's been years, but I've memorized everything he never said. I can see he really doesn't have lips the way I remembered. His mouth is just a slash under his nose. Hair, 
he combed over his bald head, hangs down like a dish rag covering his left ear. We live 30 minutes outside of New York City, but when I look over his right shoulder, I can make out Dublin. Two dead wives, empty glasses of Guinness, the wagon he could never stay on and ended up walking or crawling home most nights. It then punched and kicked anything that got in his way. Wives, kids, dogs. If I stare long enough, I can see him puff on that cigar. Smoke flowing out of his mouth, straight from the fire in his stomach. All that way, straight up from hell. Um, this is based on a, an aunt, my aunt, a last surviving aunt actually who died not too long ago. And it's called The uh, Last King of Scotland. Uh, my aunt, who was in her 90s, somehow never forgets my birthday. Every December 6th, a card arrives in my mailbox on its back, buried under bills and ads for everything I will never buy. It's always a Hallmark card with sweet, sticky rhymes that I dunk in my coffee before adding milk. When I visited her last month, she wanted to know when will I become the next King of Scotland, or better yet, a fireman. I didn't bother explaining there isn't any nobility in our family unless we count her husband, who was always a royal pain in the ass. The hook and ladder thing might have made me smile if it wasn't for all the fires I put out lately. Her face is covered in wrinkles like a dress that has spent too much time in a suitcase and hair the color of my enemy pulled into a tire resting at the back of her head. When she smiles, her wet eyes shine like lights at the bottom of a swimming pool. If I spend too much time with her, I always discover my mother's face, her younger sister, and resent my aunt for living 30 years longer. That has something to do with me punching my brother when we were kids every time he called me a mama's boy and punching him again because it was true. This is where I should mention the woman I love is in Tucson and her plane lands today in about an hour. It's also the first day of spring and the birds chirping outside tricked me for a second into thinking it's my cell phone. Maybe I should pick it up anyway and listen so I just might learn something more about flight. Um, I'm sure like all of us, um, that, you know, got sick of the staying in the apartment or in our homes and not being able to travel anywhere. And I started daydreaming about the places I wanted to go to. And, um, I guess a little over two years ago, uh, I went to Paris. I, I did a little talk to for the uh, alums in Paris and did, did a read and did a, a workshop and a reading. Then we we spent time, uh, Celia and I spent time uh, touring around Paris and taking in as much as we could. And I really want to go back, uh, like anybody who's been there wants to. Um, so what I decided the cheapest way to get back there now is just to get there in a poem. All right. So uh, that's what I did. That's why I left. And came back. It's called Paris. I'm walking through every movie, photo, and painting I've ever seen of this city. Parisian stays thin so they can walk its narrow streets and not bump into each other. Cafes are crowded and I can see Hemingway in every one, drinking and arguing with writers I don't even recognize. Wine is like a blue blazer. It goes with everything. And most days the sun is covered in cigarette smoke. Many of the buildings go all the way back to the Middle Ages. The 55 Chevy is often as old as it gets back home. Along the Seine, there are book stalls to browse through. And the best one is owned by a guy in a brown coat and leathered skin, making him look like a first edition. Passing sirens still sound the way they did when I first heard them in Anne's Frank's diary, even though it was in Amsterdam and I was in grammar school in Trenton. And this is the way they sound in all those World War II movies when Nazis occupied the city. And their sound even made heroes like Errol Flynn nervous. Just across the bridge, I can't believe I'm standing in front of Notre Dame and staring up at its two towers. I can see Quasimodo 
riding the bells as if they are giant swans, making them ring and swing over the city the way any guy would with a bad back, showing off in front of the woman he loves. I then stroll through open markets in Saint Germain where fruits are circuses of or a circus of colors and always easy to translate. Wheels of cheese cut open to show how good deep can reach and fish on ice looking as fresh as a group of spoiled rich kids. I stop in a church near Luxembourg Gardens and go over to the corner that hasn't seen sunlight since Voltaire and watch candles dance like street performers then light one instead of saying a prayer since my French isn't that good. There is a cafe nearby whose name keeps tripping over the letters in my mouth and just, just becomes a sound. After dinner, I stand outside under the moon shaped like the croissant I left on my plate. Tomorrow I'll fly home to my walk-up tenement. It looks nothing like these elegant buildings that resemble Audrey Hepburn. At least my French will be a little stronger and help me as I walk in New York City, where on any street, if you close your eyes and listen, you can hear the world. The last one I'm going to read is the uh, title, the title cut of the book. We used to call title cuts on albums, title songs. This is the title cut. It's um, playing poker with Tennessee Williams. We, we went down um, to New Orleans again, I guess a little over two years ago. Well, pre-COVID, that's for sure. And uh, we just loved it. Playing poker with Tennessee Williams. The streets are narrow perfect for horses or mules, but 300 years ago, no one saw cars coming, even if they looked both ways. Traffic jams and music are a kind of gumbo. A woman the size of a Paris fills a street corner with her voice, then plays her clarinet, each note so sweet you can drop them in your tea. The next song she plays would make Benny Goodman think about switching to piano. Beignets are covered in a snowstorm of powdered sugar that would cripple the entire French Quarter if winter down here meant what it does back home. There's nothing louder than clothes my cousin wears to parties. Bourbon Street, night or day, is a thousand of his Hawaiian shirts. On St. Peter Street, I found Tennessee Williams Building where he rented the top floor studio and began streetcar. I looked in at the front stairs. We had Stanley Stand for the first time, yelling like an abused dog, just kicked in the stomach, up to the woman he loved, who would become Stella in the next draft. I'd be the first to admit, when I walked away, I moved a little like Brando before stopping to watch a parade of school kids dancing down Royal Street. A few teachers were playing horns, banjos, and some were moving umbrellas up and down like pistons in an engine to keep those kids moving. I found myself in front of the house Williams owned, according to the plaque near the door. Across from it was Marty's restaurant, where he spent every afternoon to drink and play cards. I stared at the porch where he sat and watched myself walk over asked, and asked if I could play, pulled up a chair, then beat him at poker. Of course, I should have let him win, except I knew it was the only souvenir I would ever really want to bring home that night. Thank you. Kev, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. You read some of my favorite poems in the collection today. Really, that was wonderful. Um, I would like to personally just take a little time as we open this up to our question and answer to um, start with a question of my own to you, Kev, if you don't mind. Um, uh, there is a, a, a frequent subject of your poems that I think that you is either in the foreground or in the background of some, the, the majority of your poems um, that you keep coming back to over and over again. There, you have poems about your family. You mention your mom and your dad frequently in your poems. You chart your trials and tribulations and, and even occasional triumphs and romance and intimacy. But the subject that I think you come back to most frequently is life in New York City. And that's true certainly with this collection, but it is throughout the, the majority 
of, of, your, of all the poems that you've written. Even in this, in this collection particularly, even when what I would call even in your, your travel poems where you go outside of New York, like if you go to the Caribbean or to Florida, or even the Paris poem that you just read, about three quarters of the way into the poem, you say something along the lines of, as I book my next trip back to New York City, or when I wake, make my way back to New York, that even when you leave New York in your poems, the magnetic pull of New York City pulls you back. So this is a long-winded way of me asking you to talk to you, ask you about that, uh, the, the hold that New York City has for you as a poet and why you might, if you had to guess, why New York City has this, this hold on you. Um, I, th I think Pete Hamill said, I love New York City uh, because of and in spite of, all right? So you can fill in the blanks. Um, uh, even with all its issues, I've always loved it and continue to love it. I love the energy here. Um, uh, I love that um, I feel more alive here than anywhere else. Um, and it also has obviously seeped into my poetry, not, not just in, in the topics, but if you look at my, my poem, as most of my, my lines are on the short side, all right? So, um, it's metaphysical in the sense that I'm connected to the sidewalks, the streets, the real, real road tracks. All right? um, and so it's sort of, it's sort of, my poem is constructed the way the city is constructed, the way it moves. And shorter lines basically cre create a, a quicker pace. So I'm caught up in the pace of the city as well. Um, but I love it for its art. I love it for um, its deficiencies. I love it for its scars. I love it for its uh, beauty. Um, uh, I'm making it human, obviously, you know, uh, and, and that's, I mean, I, and I think, I think people who love it, writers who love it really, I mean, it's been written about in poetry and novels and short stories for, for, for years. Um, and, 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 mo and most of those poets and writers love the city. Um, and there's just no getting away from it. Um, and, and, and again, it, it sort of, it, it informs my work, it informs my writing. Um, and uh, that, that's the best way I can answer it. Thanks, Kev. Well, uh, let me now take the opportunity to open this up to everyone else. I think maybe the easiest way to do this is if uh, you use the, uh, the, uh, the feature where you can, in the reactions fe feature, where you raise your hand. So you can either raise your hand or you can drop it into the chat and we'll get your questions in one way or another. So uh, I, I, I pass this on to our, our, our participants if they want to ask Kev a question now. Okay. Oh, I see some coming in. Okay. Why don't we start? I'll start with my brother, Dan. Why don't you unmute yourself and ask well, your well, question? Th th thank you. I'm glad I got to go right after you, Adam, because in fact, you live in New York. So your observation about Kevin's sort of um, general theme that permeates so much of Kevin's poetry is New York City. I don't live in New York, but I'm a historian. And so I thought one theme that permeates a lot of this, a, a lot of this poetry is the presence of the past, whether it's seeing your own childhood when you look at your aunt's face or walking through the streets of Paris and imagining um, Hemingway there. So th anyway, that's an observation, but I also have a question and I'd be delighted if you could connect my observation and my question. If they're not connected, that's okay too. Um, that, that will be an answer for me. But about a year and a week ago, we lost um, a, a great American songwriter that was John Prine. He was one of the first people to die of, of COVID. And his first album came out and he was very young, like in his early twenties. Yet it was full, filled with songs about other people very different from himself. So he envisioned what it was like to be a middle-aged woman in a loveless marriage or an old couple whose family has moved on and wasn't, wasn't in contact with them anymore. And people were amazed that he was able to see this, these stories in other people, but he, in an interview, connected it to his early job as a mail carrier. So he was bringing mail to everyone's houses. So he would see the names of their children, the colleges children were applying to, and mail from their doctors and so forth. And he could kind of invent stories that weren't entirely invented. 
but he would sort of create stories about these people and then write songs about them. So what I'm wondering is when you see someone go to a park bench and sit down with a dog, how do you create that story about that person? Do you just, is it, do, you know, do you interpret symbols or signs that they have? Do you just go into your own life and just trying to imagine? I guess that's what my question is, where, when you see other people or even other things, it could be buildings or whatever, how do you get that story about those other people that enable you to write a poem about it? Well, it's, it's, funny, it's funny you should mention John Prine because he's been a great influence on my writing. You know, one of the musicians who I love, uh, his wit, his turns of phrase, uh, uh, his ability to sort of capture real emotions. And, and I, th I think any writer, well, the poet Richard Hugo said, he doesn't give it, give it uh, any, he doesn't really care about historical, historical accuracy. He wants to get the emotions right, all right? So I think what you do is you, you pick uh, some, a little bit of your own life, something, you know, your, and th there's this thing called the imagination. You know, without it, you can't write, you know that. And I, I think you just take bits and pieces uh, of your own experience, use your imagination, put it all together and come up with some, something real. Um, uh, and, and, and the better the better songs and the better poems, the better stories don't relate to, don't, don't just relate experience, they create it. So when hopefully when I read my poems, hopefully people are there when I read them. When you re listen to a John Prine song, you know, Far From Me, for instance, that's a novel in a, in a, in a song, all right? Uh, and he creates that. So you're there, you're lost. You forget that you're sitting on your couch or you're sitting at your desk or in your car, but you're with him in that song. And I try to do that in my poems that you forget where you are because I'm creating an experience. Um, and that's sort of a, a short general way of sort of hopefully answering your question a little bit. Um, but that's, 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 that's what I got. Thank you, thank you. So I, I would sum it up by saying that the emotion is real even if the particular facts are, are invented. Sure. Sure. You know, which is, again, Richard Hugo said, you, owe, you, own, uh, you owe reality nothing. You, own, you owe, owe truth to feeling everything, you know, the emotions, so. Alexandra, I see you have your hand up. I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Hi, um, just lowering my hand. Hi, Kevin, thank you so much. Hey. Um, I, I noticed, so I've heard you read a, a bunch of times and some of those I've heard before, but I think something that you do that I am, one of the many things I'm learning from you is how to sort of embody a poem for a reading. So my question is about reading out loud. So many poets, um, myself included, like reading, like writing. But reading and sort of performing is a different art form. Um, and I just wondered if you could speak to the way you, um, it, it feels like a physical act um, and, and a physical, there's a performance aspect. It's genuine, but it is different from just thinking and writing. So I just wondered if you'd speak to that a little bit. Yeah. Um... I mean, the way I look at it is if I'm going to like sweat over every word, every comma, every line break, uh, I'm going to present it when I read it as best I can. I'm not going to detract from it. Um, the other thing is I, I've said, I probably said this to you in class, that um, my response to, to writing is physical. You know, I, I like to feel it. Um, and I'm really connected to, my, to, my, to the language of my poems. Um, I, I can feel it. I can feel it in my heart. All poetry has heart in it. The good poems do anyway. I can certainly feel it in my heart, okay? And uh, I, I, I feel the language and I respond to the language. Uh, if the poem isn't working, I'm not gonna read it as successfully, all right? Um, so, um, but I, I, would, I would suggest that um, like anybody else, just connect to it and, and um, you know, it, it's, it's, part, it's, it's part of you. Uh, Yates said that when he rewrote anything, he, he remade his life. That's how connected he is to the language. I just had a class uh, in Maine and I was, I was trying to get over to them that listen to the language, feel the language, okay? You know, connect to it. Um, it's like, like your hand or your fingers, your arm. That's how connected you should be to it. So if you're gonna give a reading, it's gonna come from your heart, it's gonna be connected to your body and your, and, and your emotions, 
you know, that's the best way I can, you know, I can sort of, I hope that helps, you know, or answers it. You know. Kev, we have a question in the chat. This is from Davida, and she wants to know um, right. uh, if you have a favorite poem in this collection. Are you um, able to choose and, and asks why? Um, no, I, I can remember saying to my dad as a kid, you know, who do you love more, me or Tom or Maureen? And he said, I love you all equally. All right. So, um, you know, I love all my poems equally. There are certain poems that I guess um, there are po the poems in my life that I, you know, I remember that sort of maybe my voice changed for the better. Uh, and maybe I connect to that a little bit, or that's, I, I place that in my heart. But I, I think, um, you know, every poem is a different experience, and an extension of my, of my life. Where, where is it, Davida? There you are. I see you. And uh, so, um, thanks for coming, Davida. Great to see your face. Yeah. Um, so, um, I forgot what the, what the question was again, but... Uh, I'm asking which one of your, which was your? Oh, I, I, I really, I don't think I don't have, I don't have a favorite. Davida did have a part two and uh, says uh, that you are one of the have one of the best storytelling voices and wondered if you, if there are other storytellers who have influenced your style. Yeah, your brother's mentioned John Prine. All right, he's definitely one. Um, who else? Uh, you know, you know, I, 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 I have favorites. I, you know. Uh, I love Dylan Thomas. I love Richard Hugo. Um, I love John Fante, the prose writer, the novelist. There's a there's a Irish poet I love now. If you haven't read him, you should read him. For it's really one. His name is John Barry. He's a short story writer, novelist, and Irishman. Beautiful command of the language. It's just wonderful. Uh, it's it's a it's a real banquet when you read his work. Um, so I mean, I have so many different influences, Davida. So you know. Um, it's across the board, you know. Um, you know and I, I go I go back, I go back to the romantic poets. I go back to Wordsworth, who said, you know, write in, in the voice of of regular men. Okay, and and that's what I try to do. Heighten heighten poetry, of course. But. Thanks, Kev. We have a question, uh, Meg. I'm gonna un I'm gonna ask you to unmute yourself so you can ask your question. Hi, Kevin. Hey, Meg. Um, this is wonderful, and and uh, you've talked a lot about language, and one of the things I really love about your poems is how playful you are with language. The the only royalty in my family is this guy that's royal pain in the ass. He was, and sometimes that's a just a fabulous line, and the. Um, it, sometimes you referred to stories in the building, but then, you know, we also see them as stories, as stories, you know, they, so there's this double entendre thing going on that's so playful. And I wondered if these just come to you that way, or if you work at them and uh, just talk a little bit about process with language. Yeah. Um I remember Socrates said that uh, the only thing that can't be taught is 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 metaphor, the gift of metaphor, and um and, and you know who am I to argue with Socrates, right? But um uh, I I think that um, you can make yourself more attuned to it, you know. Uh, don't don't be um, don't be um, uh, comfortable with the first thing that comes out of your pen or or, or your or your uh, uh, your um, However, you write your pencil, your pen, your writing, or whatever. Don't be, don't be kind of, See if you can take it and twist it and turn it and listen to it again uh, and listen to it again and turn it some more. Um, never be satisfied with anything you get down on the page. All right. And who was it? Um, um, Horace said, uh, "Put put your work away for ten years." Okay. Then after ten years, read it again. If you're still happy with it, it probably works. Uh, and then uh, Alexander Pope comes down and he says, "Well, put your work away." For five years, and if you read it after five years, if, it's, well, if you like it, well, then it works. Uh, Henry James said, "Put it away for uh, five days." You know, I, I say, "Put it away overnight." You know, put your work away overnight, and and, and if you know if, if you still like it the next day, well, then maybe you got something there. If you don't, go back and rewrite it again. You know, Who is, you know, there's a lot written about Philip Roth, but I remember in in the Ghost Rider, he says, you know, the young guy asked him, you know, what do you do? 
And he said, well, I turn language I sentences around and I turn them around again, you know? And, and that's what you do. And then you play with the sound, you play, you, you, you play with it. Um, I'm bored with reality, okay? So I try to put a spin on it, all right? Um, and, um, and, and, and again, you know, I, I wanna get the emotions right, but it it's gotta be a reality that works for me in the poem. And I will put anything in the poem to get to the end, of, to get what I want. I will use anything. So if you look at my poems, you'll see, you know, you'll find Fred Astaire there. You know, what the hell is he doing there? You know, he belongs there. You know, he has a real grace. Uh, um, you know, movies, movie, jazz, jazz uh, musicians, everybody, I put them in because it helps me get to the, some, some moral truth at the end of the poem, you know? So I don't know if that, if that, if that answers your question, but. Oh, that was great. All right. Kevin, so, uh, you know, it, it, I love what you just said about being bored with reality, <laughs> because I yeah. think that's sort of where that playfulness comes in, because it's more than a, a metaphor that you've worked at. There's, there's a metaphor that you've um, fantasized or imagined that you just brings it to life for me. Yeah, and, I, and I, I think. And I, I think, you know, humor and, and twist, you know, it sort of gets you through the darkness of a poem also. The dark elements, the humor and the lightness gets you through that. You know, it's yeah. necessary. So thanks, Nick. Hey, Thank Roger. You. Kev, we have a question from Nancy Wagner and wants to ask particularly about the poems that you wrote during the pandemic. You had read one of them, but I guess the question is, is were there other ones in the collection that were written in the pandemic? Uh, they're not, they're not in that collection, um, but, um, you know, I, I, I sort of struggle with that, you know, should I write about the pandemic or not? Um, and usually I, I recommend, uh, to, to other, to students that, you know, if you're really sort of hurt emotionally or stressed out emotionally, put, and, and you're right, put it away, then write about it a couple of months later, you know, or a couple of weeks later. However, um, you know, the pandemic was going to go on and on and on, and I needed to make sense of it in the moment. Uh, so I had to write about it right then and there, because um, I was I was uh, full of anxiety. I was fearful. I was angry. But the poem the poem actually ends on a bit of hope, hopefulness at the end. You know, the white the, the trees outside the apartment. You know, as if they're dipped in ice cream. You have to end a poem like that with some type of positivity, so you can, so you want to at least write another poem. If nothing else, all right. So, um, Nancy. So I. So I don't really. I actually have one other poem, but it didn't make it into the collection. You know. um, I think we had a question from Tom. Tom, did you? I think you raised your hand, and I want to give you the chance to ask the question that you that you wanted. Yeah, to ask. yeah, Tom. What is? <laughs> yeah. well, actually, I wasn't going to. Wasn't going to ask a question. I was actually going to make a make a statement. Um, I'm Tom's. I'm Kevin's brother and I'm a little bit younger than Kevin and not much. And Kevin and I often talk on the phone a few times a week. And sometimes we talk about people who were born to do what they do. <clears throat> we were talking the other day about Mick Jagger and I said, the guy was born to do what he does. He's so amazing. And I still remember when we were young, um, if I didn't know the answer to something, which was quite often, I'd ask Kevin. And if he didn't know the answer, he would make something up. And so I think looking back at it, I think he was really born to do what he does because his imagination, even as a little kid, was unbelievable. Um, so, you know, some people have asked him about words and, you know, how he works at it. And I still think, you know, you know maybe you were just born to do what you do. Oh, man. Which is great. Thanks, man. Thanks. I love you. Thank you. Thanks. Boy. Well, still keeping this a family thing. My, my sister has a question now, Rachel. Hey, Rachel. You, um, okay, hi. Um, so my question is a bit about your craft. So um, you mentioned just now in an answer to someone else's question, how you'll throw anything in to help you to get to the emotional truth that you are trying to with the poem, right? And so, I was thinking about, do you actually sometimes have vivid imagery that you'll write a phrase out that you don't know where it's gonna go and if it's gonna go into a poem at all and you hold on to it to find a place later that says, ah, whatever, maybe like you mentioned, 
um, Fred Astaire's grace that someday you're gonna like you jot down Fred Astaire's grace and that you know at some point I'm gonna put that in when I need to talk about grace mm -hmm. or um, in the first poem you read when you when you talk about the pomegranate and the roses in your hands I mean this very vivid image and it works in that poem but it's also somewhat separate from the poem it doesn't automatically flow into that so I was wondering in terms of your craft do you hold on to sort of some vivid images or vivid phrases to stick in where you need them. Um, yeah, yeah that, that, that's pretty close. I mean, I, basically a poem starts with an idea or a phrase or an image uh, and I build around it. Um, and it's a, um, I, necessarily, I, don't, I don't put them aside, I make, I make them fit. I make sure I work on it and work on it. I work on it doggedly to make sure I make the image of that that came to me that I think has something to make it fit in the poem. Um, and and, um, and, and it's, it's like a, a, a possession. So if I'm working on a poem and I wanna make say an image or a line work, I will, um, uh, I will just be obsessed with it and work on it consistently until I get, get it to where I want it, you know? Um, so, I, so, so that sort of answers your question, yeah, it, it, you know, it, it, yeah, I get bits and pieces and I, and, I, and I keep working on them, working on them. It's like taking dough, I guess, and spreading it out, you know, and rolling it out, rolling it out, rolling it out. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's what I do. That's what I do, that's how it works. Thanks. Thank you, that's really helpful. Thank you. Well, I don't see that there's anyone else in the queue to ask a question. Let me just open this. I have many questions to ask Kevin, so I can certainly take this on. But I certainly want to give other people the opportunity other than just uh, 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 to me. All right, I'm going to take this opportunity, Kev, to uh, ask you about you mentioned this in your part. You just mentioned this. I want to talk to you particularly about what I see as the nostalgia in your poems. I'd say at least half of your poems, you mentioned that you make reference to, you make use of, uh, of Fred Astaire or jazz musicians. One might think just from reading your poems that you are like 20 or 30 years older than you actually are. Just given the frame of reference of your pop culture references, they really were artists, um, primarily jazz artists, but other movie stars that really peaked in the 40s, the 30s, 40s and 50s. Mm -hmm. Reading your poems, even sometimes you make reference to like a, a, a celebrity of today, like you in your recent collection, you made a reference to Beyonce and Brad Pitt. And it actually almost is jarring because it seems as if your poems are sort of cast in another era. So I really wanted to talk to you specifically about what that era of popular music and that popular entertainment, how that resonates with you. You know, well, um... First of all, I love jazz music, jazz standards. Uh, so you'll, you'll hear a lot of references, you know, and, and those those musicians are gone, you know. Um, and um, and I, I love old movies. Um, uh, but there's a certain um, grace to those. When I, when I, now I, I mentioned Fred Astaire, but I remember watching him and saying, the grace he shows on the stage when he's, you know, when they're filming him, I want to get that grace in the way my lines move or what Yeats calls a more passionate syntax, okay? So those, that, that, that appeals to me. Um, and, 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 the, and the songwriters um, from that era are, are just magnificent writers. Um, um, uh, I don't know, I'm going blank at the moment. Uh, you know, the Gershwins, I mentioned the Gershwins in the various poems. Uh, um, you know, um, I just mentioned Billie Holiday and some, you know, a singer and the, the grace of her voice. Um, so um, I, I just think there's a there's an appeal there um, that I don't want it. I don't want it. I hope it doesn't ever become lost, you know. Um, and I, you know, I want it to live on. I want it to live on in the classical sense, the way it lives on in poetry in the classical sense. Like all the, th those artists will be around in a hundred years. Those songs will be around in a hundred years. Good poetry will be around in a hundred years. That's what I mean about living in the classical sense. So, so I, I don't know that. And yeah, I'm su I'm surprised. Brad Pitt and Beyonce were in there as well. Yeah, I don't know how the hell did they get in there. Yeah. Yeah. If I even I I think maybe nostalgia is the wrong word, Kev, because that's why I say that Brad Pitt and Beyonce jump out because it seems when you speak of them, it doesn't seem as if you're speaking about a time long gone by. 
It seems as if they are current and present in the emotional and world of, that you create in, the, in, in your poems. But just by the fact that so many of them have been dead for 50 or more years. Well, it, and, may, and maybe that will make people go look them up. I mean, I mean when I talk to students and I'll say, and I'll say to them, do you know that Beatles song? And then you'll go, no. I don't know a Beatles song, who the, you know? It's like, come on, I, I know it's not your era, but know it, you know, know your history, you know? Um, uh, just because I wasn't, you know, around in the 1930s, until I happened to love that music, you know? I happened to love, love those movies. Um, you don't have to live in that era to appreciate and love it. Um, I think it's, you know, it's called art, it should live. Well, folks, we are just about coming to the end of this extraordinary afternoon. Kev, I wanna thank you from on behalf of everyone here who has attended uh, to, to thank you for sharing this afternoon with us and with sharing your amazing poems with us. I am going to take the opportunity now to uh, drop the link to uh, Amazon where folks can uh, into the chat where you can all um, get your own fantastic copy and I hope that you we all have an opportunity to meet in person where you can get Kevin to graciously sign a copy of his new collection so Kev on behalf of all of us I want to thank you all I want to thank you for for spending this afternoon with us thank you thank you all for coming uh, thank you Adam thank you all right thanks very much well thanks everyone have a great rest of your afternoon <laughs>